check. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro. Is my star pupil. I taught 17 years in university. If a student came in late, I'd ask him, I said, are you late for this class or early for the next? <laughs> One of the funniest things I ever did, I taught freshman Bible. First day in class, the freshman trying to find their Bible class. I'd wait till the bell rang. I walk in, I said, oh my, I'm so glad to see so many sign up for Hebrew Greek 222. <laughs> Boy, they're grabbing schedules and they're going out the door. I told him, settle down. All right, um, I'll give you another two minutes. Are you going to take uh, names of uh, here or how many you're going to have to have for next week? Or what, whatever you want to do. They're going to be up here in the first four rows in just a minute, so you'll be okay. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to start right now on a couple of housekeeping rules. Uh, if you've never attended a class of uh, mine, we're having it out here because the other class is too small. Uh, if you want to participate in this class, you'll have to be on the first four rows. Uh, you can sit a place you want to, but anybody beyond row four will not be allowed to ask a question or make a comment. So you can do what you uh, want to do if you want to be a part of this class. So uh, if you want to get up and move right now and get up here and be a part of this class, you're welcome to get up and move. These are my rules. Yeah. And... Uh, and they will be enforced. Like I said, if you're beyond row four, uh, you cannot ask a question or make a comment. And uh, because it's two, two things. One, let's have a class where we can have some interaction. This idea of people commenting in the back in some place, hey, not going to do it on my watch, okay? And secondly, I have hearing aids. I had problems with hearing, so I can only work with the first four rows. So whatever you, wherever you want to sit, that's fine with me. But as far as participation in my class, First four rows uh, is the rule. So whatever you want to do, you can uh, do just fine. I have decided, I figured out a long time ago why people sit in back rows anyway in church because they can't find any pews in the, in the parking lot. So yeah, they, 
So that's my idea. Let me introduce you to uh, my approach to teaching, uh, right or wrong. Uh, here's what uh, it is. Um, I have three objectives in every sermon I preach uh, that I want to accomplish. I have three objectives in this six-week class. I'll not accomplish these objectives in each class, but on the overall six weeks, I will try to do so. Uh, number one, I want to teach you something you do not presently know. In other words, I want to increase your, your, your knowledge. Two, I want to increase your faith, help your faith to grow and mature. And thirdly, I want you to challenge to follow Jesus. So in every sermon, if you watch me carefully, every one of those things will be incorporated in a sermon, and also they'll be incorporated in this class. Now, in this class, it's not going to be able to be able to do it uh, in every class, but in the overall six weeks, everything is uh, determined that way. Um, when I train young men to preach, I told them, don't you dare don't you dare ever preach something to change the lives of people if it hasn't changed you. That was the rule of thumb that I taught my young boys to preach. I live by that rule. I will not share with you something that has not changed me first and, uh, and made a difference in my life. I have learned in this study far more than I'm ever going to be able to teach you. I will, I'll promise you that. The full outline is 24 pages. I would urge you to maybe make a notebook if you want to do that. Keep it in some kind of a folder or something. If you want to do that, that would be fine. But hopefully you're going to be exposed to more in this class than really I will have time to work with you and, and to do for you. I preached down in Huntsville, Alabama for a period of time. They would fly me back and forth from St. Louis. And uh, after several months, one of the elders called me aside and said, we really enjoy having you coming, but we're having a problem with you. I said, what's that? And he said, let me ask you something. Did you ever try to get a drink out of a fire hydrant? And I said, uh, no. He said, well, you can get your mouth around it, but it's hard to get, your, you know, get a good drink. I recognize that I am too fast at times. Okay, I, I understand that. I'm well aware of that. Uh, Scott uh, didn't quite represent me correctly. I do uh, 100 words a minute with Gus up to 210 uh, when I really want to do and when I really want to roll with some things because um, sometimes I just don't uh, probably take the time that I should have. That's a shortcoming of my teaching and uh, an imperfection and you will just probably have to, uh, uh, to live uh, with that. Um, so th those are some of the preliminaries. Uh, Kent Longer is a very good uh, close friend of mine, and uh, he, um, uh, he worked with me when I worked for the book on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, uh, which was a very interesting experience. I spent 15 years studying that book, uh, or, or making that book. The first seven years after deciding I didn't know what I was talking about, uh, Lynn can verify this, the night I decided that I was totally messed up after seven years of study, I uh, went up to uh, the bedroom from the basement and didn't sleep for probably three days, realizing I had basically destroyed everything I had ever believed. I then took the next seven years to uh, finish uh, writing uh, the book uh, for what that's uh, worth. It was very hard to stop and print the book because I would learn something. I said, well, I need to incorporate that. Well, I need to incorporate that. I have done the same thing with this information that I'm sharing with you. That um, uh, Kent Longer's illustration was, he worked on the F-18s with uh, Boeing, and he said that, uh, he said, you will chase that plane down the runway. And I didn't figure out what he wanted to know. In other words, I will always keep adding something. And uh, Dennis has already experienced that uh, with me when I send him a copy, then I send him the revised copy, and then I send him the revised revised uh, copy. So uh, it's an ever-learning process for me. I'll be honest with you, this I have studied this probably for the last two years. Um, 
I have learned, I have found passages of scripture that I did not know that existed, uh, and then they have come to life in a very uh, a special way. I assume everybody has the first seven page outline. If you don't have that, you can raise your hand and I'll make sure you got it. Is everybody okay? All right, now, where I started on this study, believe it or not, uh, Rubel Shelley, who uh, uh, lives in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, was a student of mine, uh, believe it or not, back in 1966, if you can date that far back. And uh, he did a series of lectures called Meet the Family. And uh, student, uh, Rubel is a very, uh, very adept uh, uh, biblical uh, scholar, does a, does a great job. In fact, he has now just finished a book on LGBTQ uh, plus uh, that was published by uh, College Press in Joplin and just came out uh, probably about three weeks ago. He's done a very, very excellent job on it. Uh, and he's written, of course, a number of books. Uh, side note, I have dedicated myself to writing uh, my book on LGBTQ, and we're hoping to have it uh, published sometime by June uh, 1st. And so his book and my book will be a great uh, companion volume together. So the background of what I'm sharing with you is a series of lectures that I heard him do called uh, Simply Meet the Family. And uh, he, he, he really a challenging uh, uh, with a number of things and uh, raised my uh, interest uh, a great deal. So that's where some of this uh, uh, came from. I I've never started a class this way, but I plan to fail in this class. I don't believe I'm smart enough to explain this thing to you. I'm going to do the best I can <coughs> Uh, how many have ever had a class on the Trinity? How many have ever heard a sermon on the Trinity? Got one hand. It, it, it's all new stuff. It, and, and, and that's why I got these first passages of Scripture that you might want to consider. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom of the knowledge of God, how unsearchable His judgments his past beyond tracing out, who has known the mind of the Lord, who has been his counselor, who has been given to God, and that God should repay him. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Romans 11. Then from Job. Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens above. What can you do? They are deeper than the depths below. What can you know? So to take the position that I can know and understand God and I can explain it to you in rational terms would be totally out of place for me. Before we came here tonight, most of you know that Jerry Williamson, the preacher at Florissant, lost his eight-year-old grandson. The last account I had, and I haven't asked him directly, I have talked to him. They don't know why I died. Jerry has written, is it on Facebook, Lindy? Yeah. He wrote the most gut-wrenching thing I have ever read in my life tonight. in his expression of trying to understand what's happened. Why? How? And as I talked to him a, a couple of days ago, I said, Jerry, I don't have any answers. 
I don't have great platitudes. I can't say I understand because I don't. I can't answer the question why. I have no explanations. Class, we're, 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 we're launching into some, we're launching into some pretty deep water. And, I, and I'm not sure we can fully understand that. You see point two in your outline? For those of you who come in late, do you all have an outline? Okay, I, I, you people are coming in late. You need to get back there and uh, give the outlines, please. Number two, God cannot be fully understood by finite man and still be God. That's my basic thesis. Explaining the splitting of the atom and how to use a cell phone to Columbus as he was getting off the Mayflower. My eight-year-old grandson better understands my phone than I do. How would you explain marriage and parenting to a two-year-old? You see, that's where we are. The early church debated the nature both of God and Jesus. And this is what Scott indicated earlier uh, in his lesson Sunday morning when he talked about my class. What is Jesus? 50% man, 50% God? Is he uh, 90% God, 10% man? What's going on and what's taking place? And so that was a, a major debate and a major concern in the, uh, in the early church. Number five in your outline, Trinity began to be discussed in the second century. Why it began to be discussed at that particular time in that particular effort, I don't know. I think it had to do with their forming of creeds. But well, that would just be uh, my guess. The word Trinity is not found in scriptures, and neither is the word incarnation, omnipresence, Bible found in scriptures. The doctrine of the Trinity is seen as a difficult problem. The Bible says that there are three distinct persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that each of these persons is God. However, the Bible says there's only one God. The problem is, does that mean the Bible is involved in a contradiction? How do we assimilate all this material? How do we put it in form? What, what, what are our limitations of knowledge, understanding, and intelligence? Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, what difference does it make? It's going to make a lot of difference. Especially as we come down to the end of our class, as I begin to show you how this then is involved. Let's go to Exodus 33. There was a struggle, and keep in mind, when you look at the uh, Old Testament, Torah, Torah class is not a revelation of man, it's a revelation of God. Now you've got to keep that in mind when you read the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a story of people struggling to understand God. God, you mean to tell me you're going to wipe out the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah completely? Okay, let me, let's make a deal. Would you, if we could find 50 righteous, would you not do it? 
What does God say? Hello? Yeah, okay. Find 50. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. Instead of finding 50, if we just found 40, would it be okay? Mm, yeah, okay. What about 30? You know, would you do it for 20? Abraham got to 10 and stops. Why? Because, you see, Abraham was struggling on what kind of God are you that you would do this. He was just concerned about the nature and the character of God. So when, when you look at the Old Testament, always look at it from that particular viewpoint that you're looking at people struggling to understand God. This is what you're going to find then here in the Ezekiel of uh, uh, or Exodus, uh, 30, Exodus 32, I got to turn place. Exodus chapter 32. All right, look then at, ver, uh, uh, I'm in 33, I'm sorry, 3320. 3320. But he said, You cannot see my face. See, you have what's called anthropomorphisms when it comes to the nature of God. We talk about the eyes of God, the hand of God. What about God's wings? He's not a bird, he's not a man, you see? So, 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 so these are descriptive adjectives trying to portray exactly what's going on. So he said, you cannot see my face. For no one may see me and live. Verse 21. Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will let you, I will put you in the cleft of that rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. You see me, and I'll melt your transistors. You cannot handle this at all. Here's a passage that I found the other day. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. They have just inserted this thing in the last couple of months, in case you want to know. I had never noticed this from class. Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, let's come down to, we'll, we'll go to verse 27. We're, we're talking about the, these great people who persevered and so on, and, uh, and what they uh, did. Uh, and of course, Moses then becomes uh, one of these uh, uh, illustrations. I'll start in, in, in 27 for you. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered. Now, listen, this is what I had noticed. He saw him who is invisible. All right, class, chew on that one for a while. <laughs> How do you see something that's invisible? You see the effort that scriptures then are trying to have in portraying to us the nature and the character of God. Uh, look at Job 42. I'm in point eight if you're in the same outline. Job said, here comes the end of all this stuff. My ears have heard of you, but my, now my eyes have seen you. Now let that sink in. My eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Here's the key to, to a lot of morality and a lot of ethics in both Old Testament and New Testament. A seeing has to take place before doing. Doing. 
And once somebody sees something, it will have a lot to do with their doing. And, and Paul will use that, and I, I won't Paul, drop into Pauline uh, ethical teachings, but Paul will do this, and I'll show it maybe at the end of our six weeks. Paul would say, when you understand gospel, and when you understand redemption, and when you understand cross, it has a lot to do with what you do. The Old Testament had a similar ethical theology. That is, it was absolutely essential that they have a clear understanding and view of God in order for them to be able to have conduct or action. If you read the Old Testament carefully, God is pretty well opposed totally, 100% to idolatry. He's not afraid of the competition, folks. Elijah and the Baal of Prophets can show that for you. But he knew that people in idol worship became what they worshipped. And most of the gods of the Canaanites, the Hivites, various other tribes were very immoral. And so the ethical foundation of Old Testament theology was for the purpose of seeing and understanding who God is. And that's fine, you find this constant reminder of be ye holy as I am holy. And so that, that's the basis of the background. So understanding the nature of God is extremely, extremely important, and it reflects them back on the ethics taking place. Okay, let me stop. Question, comment. Clear as mud, right? Okay, let's go to number nine. Is how all this then became to be revealed. Uh, there are obviously a lot of scriptures that I left out, but a lot of scriptures I included in this outline. If you uh, stay with me on this thing, just uh, some of them that uh, would be there. Uh, John 14, 26, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. And that was the promise that Jesus gave to the 12. Chapter 16 and verse 8, when he comes, he will prove, NLV, he will convict the world to be wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. Acts 2 and verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, all Scripture is God-breathed. Page 2. Chapter 6, verse 17. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In uh, Acts 7 and verse uh, 51, uh, Stephen's speech near the end, he says, you stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Of course, they were resisting what he was saying uh, and the conclusions that uh, he was making. Hebrews 4 and verse 12, the Word of God is alive and active. And this was very crucial in the uh, development of the book of Hebrews. Interesting passage in Jeremiah 23, 29. It is not my word, is not, is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks rock into pieces. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets through the human though human, spoke from, uh, from God as though they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 
1 Peter 4 and verse 11, if anyone speaks, he should do so as one speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13, For you have received the word of God, which you heard from us. You accepted it not as human word. And this is a very, this is a very uh, powerful passage. But it is, it actually is the word of God. Romans chapter 3 and verse 2, The Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 2, God spoke to our ancestors. He spoke to us by his son. John 12 and verse 48, words I have spoken will condemn. Now what's also interesting is throughout the New Testament, they would refer to uh, the, the words. Okay, let me give you a couple of illustrations. Go to 1 Thessalonians 4. So you have several allusions, and, and I'm not going to deal with the sense of inspiration. That's another topic. But I'm trying to show you that the, the word that was spoken then it was reiterated uh, many times. Look at chapter 4 of uh, this. Uh, where am I going to go? Come down to verse uh, 15 for you. According to the Lord's word. So you see, Paul makes a reference back to what the Lord said. You follow me, class? Okay. Back, he says, according to the Lord's word. Uh, Go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, Paul is giving this final speech to these uh, these elders. Now watch what he says, which is very interesting. Uh, 20, what have I got here? Uh, 35, yeah. Okay, 20 and verse 35, he says, In everything I did, I showed you this kind of hard work. We must help the weak. Watch this, class. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So what you find in the New Testament is you find several references, especially by Paul, back to something that Jesus said Uh, ancient people depended more on their memory than we normally do. They would memorize great sections of various kinds. So that would be uh, an illustration uh, of that. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. Let me illustrate it for you again. Seven ten. He said, to the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. So you see, he references back to something that Jesus basically uh, has uh, said. You find it also in 1 Corinthians, look at um, 11 and verse 23 in connection with the uh, Lord's Supper. He said, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. So when you understand how Scripture is put together, you understand then that these people would go back to what the Lord said and and, 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 and rehearsed it. How much they really knew, I don't know. Uh, Let me give you one more illustration. Go to Galatians 1 and verse 12. This is where Paul's uh, apostleship is being uh, questioned, uh, is being authentic in some ways. Uh, He said... I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by a revelation from Jesus Christ. So what you need to understand is that as the Holy Spirit is involved in the transmission of Scripture, these people then held that in high esteem. And that's why then you would find it quoted uh, several times. Uh, most of you know that I grew up in a welding shop. In 1946, my father uh, 
came out of the Navy and started what is known, became known as Jones and Lockhart Welding, 1946. 1946, I was uh, eight years old. My brother, uh, 15, 16 years old. So we grew up learning how to weld. Uh, I learned to burn my first rods. I wouldn't call it welding as such. I learned to burn my first rods when I was probably 12 years old. Uh, Dad gave me some old steel and some old rods that were, had been wet. He gave me a machine to go out and back and, and learn how to hold a bead. Well, I went out there. And uh, when I finished this, it looked like a porcupine. Do you understand what happened? Because when you stick a rod and it doesn't burn, it just sticks. And you gotta go this and get rid of it. And so I end up with this big piece of steel that had porcupine rods all over the place. I came back in at noon, get lunch, and he said, how you doing, son? I said, not too good. He said, well, keep going till you learn how to hold a bead. I said, okay. So I finally got out there and finally learned how uh, to hold a bead, and I became uh, not a full-fledged welder, but I could at least hold a bead. My dad was an outstanding welder in every way. Uh, sometimes we'd have to hire people to come in to, uh, to work in the shop to be welders. So when, when they'd come in, Dad would give them a welding test to see how good a welder they were. And you have to understand, Marlon knew my dad real well. He's sort of a gruff type person at times and uh, had a, just an eighth grade education. Brilliant mechanically, eighth grade education, though. And somebody come in to uh, try out for a job my dad would say to me, he said, son, he's not any good. I said, dad, how do you know? He said, he's an old t-shirt welder. I said, a what? He's a t-shirt welder. If you're a welder and you come in here in the summertime and you want to learn to weld, you better have a long sleeve shirt on. So I learned that the difference between a welder was the difference in the length of his shirt. T-shirt or otherwise. All right. What's that got to do with something? It has to do, but we'll do something else first. I want your hand on your Bible. Repeat after me. This is my Bible. The inspired Word of God. If he says it's so, it's so. What he says I am, I am. What he wants me to be, I will be. Where he sends, I will go. The power is not mine, but his. The plan is not of man, but God. As I hold to his teachings, I will know what I need to know. And when I know what I need to know, I'll be free. Amen. Amen. One of the things that I have as an objective tonight is to either renew or help you rededicate a respect for Scripture. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 1 and 3.16, it talks about a lot of false teachers going out into the world. Acts 20, Paul warned about wolves and sheep's clothing. This book, and I'll say this a little bit later, I think I'll say, is basically my GPS. I have a deep and abiding respect. 
Even if culture has left the station, back to your outline, the biblical ink is dry. 1 John 2 and verse 14 says, And the word of God lives in you. Go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, one of the great, great psalms. The great psalm, but I mean this is one of the mountaintops as far as I am concerned. Psalm 111, and the psalms are just very interesting uh, uh, to look at. Psalm 119, one, uh, let's see, well, we'll go to verse 11 to start with. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Look at 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. I've been involved in ministry 60 plus years. I am not convinced that men today are as strong in the word as they were 10 or 20 years ago. Is that a judgment and opinion? Absolutely. But it's based upon, I think, upon evidence. We have some great classes here at Maryland Heights on Sunday morning. Excellent classes. Half this church doesn't come. Maybe can't get there. Maybe we're sick or something. Am I being judgmental? Yeah, I guess I am. When we boil it down, folks, and this is one of the things I hope I can motivate you to do in this class is have a thirst and a drive to know scripture and what's really there. And have that learning spirit. I made a statement here and I probably shouldn't have, but I'll explain it. The LGBTQ plus community has gone what's called beyond Paul to support same-sex relationships. As you well know, I've lectured on this thing at Harding University. I've conducted Zoom classes with preachers in 10 different states. Trying to explain what's going on and what's taking place. And see, the LGBTQ community... at least far to part of it, firm community, have finally decided that the Scripture doesn't justify their conclusions that they, they are then going to have to go beyond Paul. And that's a discussion uh, for a, a later time. The Bible is not a celestial fire insurance policy. It's an investment strategy. We are called to be craftsmen and not admirers of the word. Go to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. The book of Hebrews class is the, probably the only book that I know of that was good possibility it was a sermon to the early church. It's not like any other book that you would read in the Bible. It doesn't start out with identification to whom it's addressed and so on like this. When you get to the end of Hebrews, it refers to it as a word of exhortation. It's a sermon. Now, what was our problem? If you understand how church history happens, you have the man, the message, the movement, and the monument. 
Those are the four stages of religion. Okay? What you find then in early Christianity is you have the man, Jesus. You have the message, the gospel. You have the movement, you have Christianity. But invariably, things will become a monument. All right, church starts, round numbers class, 80-30. Book of Hebrews. Let's put it round numbers, 60. The average age in the ancient world for both men and women were probably late 40s, average. You have large numbers of people in Jewish circles converted in the early days of Acts. How many on Pentecost? How many class? 3,000. Okay, you have scores of people. How old would their children have been when Hebrews was written, roughly? Help me out. To what? 20, 30? So you end up with a church in the 60s that have not come out of paganism, they have not come out of Judaism, but they have been raised in the church. And the second generation didn't get it. All right, go to Hebrews 5. We'll start in verse 12. In fact, though, by the time you ought to have been teachers, you have to need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by, watch your Bibles carefully, constant Use have training themselves to distinguish between good from evil. They were not mature, they didn't grow up. They ended up being admirers of the word, but not craftsmen of the word. Now, let me come back to my t shirt illustration for you, lest I forget. I am not electronically inclined. I am the world's worst in that. All said and done, okay? Let me urge you, if you're going to do an in-depth study of Scripture, get a Bible that you can mark up, write in the margin, Make notes, write things in the front and back, wear it out. That's the only way I know to study. Now, a lot of you have just your Bible in your hand, and that's fine if that's what you want to do. Uh, To me, it'd be like going to a knife fight, taking a fingernail clippers with you. I would really urge you to do in-depth Bible study this way. If you if it's working for you the other way, that's fine. Go for it. Be honest with you folks. In my opinion, my judgment, take it for what it's worth, throw it out the window, discard it. Get a book where you can write and what's going on and cross-reference. That has been the way that I have studied Scripture uh, in, in all this time has been very, very helpful to me. I am afraid and I am fearful 
that we can create a church that admires the Word of God but does not have the ability to be craftsmen of the Word of God. Is that a judgment call? Yeah, it's a judgment call. If you agree with it, that's fine. If you don't, fine. Either way. But do we really have that thirst and desire to know? The Bible study for me at times can be the most frustrating thing I've ever thought about doing. Because the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. Or that maybe uh, I have forgotten. There are two extremes. Go back to your notes again. We sometimes either live in fear that we didn't get it all right, or we live in arrogance that we did get it right. I have had to change some of my views about a lot of things, folks. To admit that I studied the subject of marriage and divorce for seven years and had to come to the conclusion that I was totally wrong. And Lynn can tell you the struggle I went through. Throw out what you believed and taught for seven years. Because you see, we have to have the drive to, to what degree are we willing to be honest with Scripture and to understand what Scripture is really trying to tell us. We must be students, apprentices forever. There are a lot of things I admire about Paul. He comes to the end of his life. Let's look at it. 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is it. He's winding it down. Been discouraged a little bit. Look at verse 9. Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me. Demas was one of his co workers' class, he was the beloved Demas. Paul had invested his time and energy and work into helping this young man mature. And he finally had to say, hey, he's gone. He blew it. He loved this present world. Verse 11. Only Luke's here. He's been my faithful companion for a long, long time. And then it's interesting. Get Mark and bring him with you because he has helpful me in my ministry. Do you remember back in Acts when he threw him off the boat? Barnabas picked him up, nurtured him, Restored him to Paul's confidence. Verse 13 is where I want to go. And when you come, you bring the cloak that I left at Carpus 
with scorpions at, at Troas and my scrolls. And especially the parchments. Class, Paul was a student to the end. To the very end. He was a learner. Was he Apostle Paul? Yes, he was the Apostle Paul. But he was still a learner. Remember I told you one of the most frustrating things I know of about Scripture is the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. That's the frustrating things. We never really grow out of an apprenticeship. We are continual learners. And this is what I hope, what I'm trying to do is, is to, to get you to fall in love with this book. I, I don't want you to worship the book. That's not what I'm saying. I want you to work, worship the Jesus and the God of this book, okay? But it's the only place I can learn. Go to James chapter 1. Verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that is, gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. When Jesus tells us something we must do, we cannot respond by saying maybe. We don't have that option, class. The Bible does not allow us, or the gospel does not allow us, the luxury of indecision. We'll talk more about this toward the end of the class. A passage I added just today, you might want to put it down in your notes next to James 1.22, is 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 10. You remember the call of Samuel? The call of Samuel when he, he did call and he went in there and asked Eli, what did you say? And Eli said, no, I didn't say anything. How many times did that happen? Three, right? What was the last thing, though? First Samuel 2 3 and 10, Eli said, the next time you hear that, say, speak, your servant hears. This then is the attitude I think we've got to have towards Scripture. Go to Luke 2. Luke 2, 
verse 46 and 47. And for three days they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Watch the next verse, class. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. I'll not look at it. You can go look at it for yourself. But Jesus and his temptations, the three answers that Jesus gave, he gave out of Deuteronomy. Jesus, when he was tempted to sin, quoted Deuteronomy. Scripture was extremely important to Jesus. I said all that to say this, that having a healthy respect and an understanding of the Word of God and a searching for what He wants me to be and what He wants me to do is basically the quest that we've got to be on. We really have no option. I'm going to recommend a book to you by Ethelgard Smith, 30 Days with Jesus. You have it there in your outline. Lynn and I bought two copies of this book. She read one, I read the other one for 30 days. It's a short devotional book. I would really encourage you, if you're serious, and want to know more about Jesus and make an impact in your life by that book. And I promise you, 30 days later, you'll be different. You'll be different in what happens, what takes place. So what if we had an objective tonight? is to establish the importance of knowing God, having the limitations of knowing God, and being a better student of His Word. I don't know what you're going to get out of this class. I will tell you, you will get about as much in as you put into it. And... Uh, I'm going to put everything I've got into it, as you've already seen. And if you want to come along and take the journey, then I think hopefully it'll be uh, a good trip uh, to make. Uh, do you need to know how many, you, you okay on numbers? He's going to give the rest of the outlines. It's uh, pages 8 then through uh, probably 24 Sunday. I would really urge you to make preparation for this class. I think it would be very helpful to you. And again, you will get out as much of it as you uh, uh, put into it. Uh, Jim, are some announcements that need to be made or anything? Uh, Jim Martin came home to the hospital. He still has a week and he's on oxygen. Okay. Uh, Paul and Don Lombardo are home. Okay, see, I, I can't hear the announcement. And, and it's serious, and folks, I'm, I'm not trying to be nasty or hard, okay? <laughs> Next week, fill this bench up for me. I even backed up for you to do it. And I, you know, I did have a student that I had assigned seats in university. About the third week, he said, I, I don't like my seat. I said, what do you mean you don't like your seat? He I said, you can, see the, you can see the board and everything here. Everybody. He said, I'm getting powder burns sitting up here close. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm sorry. Finally, one day I was lecturing long lane and I spit on a kid. <laughs> Didn't mean to. <laughs> I want to wipe the face off. I said, son, I'm sorry. I apologize. He's, oh, that's all right. I said, let me tell you something. That's the nearest to holy water you'll ever get to, okay? <laughs> all right. Be a student of mine. First four rows next week. No excuse. You're adjourned. <laughs>